all over. Four years, hard work. Just remarkable scenes. And remarkable noise. And if John Aloisi can score this goal... Aloisi, the pace is back. He moves it. Here's Aloisi for a place in the World Cup. because I played with uh, Chingy Morales and Pablo Garcia in, uh, in Spain, and I copped it for three years, uh, saying Australians can't play, you know, we're, we're, we're better than you, we're too good for you, we're going to smack you again. The tunnel incident was with Chingy Morales and, uh, and Tony Popovich. You know, Morales made a big mistake because you, you just don't cross Popper. You know, he's, he's a tough player, Morales. He doesn't give you an inch on the field, and, and we as defenders uh, didn't give him anything, and I think it's another sign of, you know, we're not backing down, we're ready for this this time. And we didn't want to get pushed around. This was our home ground, this was our turf. You know, we'll push you around, we'll show you who's boss. One of our players had one of their players by the, by the throat, and that's when I knew that it would be very tough to beat us. He just tried to stamp his authority walking out again that was something that you know maybe four years earlier you, you kind of uh, walk past and, and don't want to say anything but you know this time it was basically get out of my way and you know we're here to do a job um, you know your words or your threats or you standing in front of us is not going to make any difference to uh, the mission we have ahead where four years earlier Maybe that would have affected me. Maybe it would have affected some of the other boys. But this time, you know, we're ready to, to do the job. We had to deal with a, with a very desperate Uruguayan side. And uh, we should have been forewarned after what had happened back in the 70s. We probably lost uh, the player of the generation because of what happened against Uruguay. These soccer players in Australia's national strip of gold and green are known as the Socceroos. And in the space of 14 months, they've waltzed their way into the finals of the World Football Championship in West Germany. Team captain Peter Wilson is a car salesman. Goalkeeper Jack Riley and in the white tracksuit, Adrian Alston. And the player injured against Uruguay who won't be playing in Germany, Ray Bartz. People forget that we played Uruguay in 1974 prior to the World Cup Finals. One in Melbourne that we drew nil-nil. And everybody said, well, when they get you in Sydney, they'll murder you. I had the ball in my hands, looked up the field, and saw that an elbow from a Uruguayan player go right into the throat of Ray Bartz. To me, one of the best players who ever played for Australia. Bartz went down as if he were dead, never to play the game again. Then not long after that, it was half time, went in and didn't feel too good, said to the doc, oh, I've got a stinking headache. And he said, yeah, Barnes, you have a couple of Aspera, you'll be right. I managed to score um, one of the better goals I think I'd ever scored. And then later in the game, uh, we had a corner. One of their players is complaining and so forth. And I tell him to look at the scoreboard. He turned around and just punched me on the chin um, and knocked me to the ground. As I was laying on the ground, their players grouped around the guy that hit me and one of their players smacked him on the mouth and made his mouth bleed and said, uh, oh, Australia number eight, he hit our guy first. He ended up getting sent off, but the damage um, that I incurred after the game was happened from the first half blow. We didn't realise how bad it was until later, when we were ready to start playing again, and Ray Bites will never kick another ball. I virtually had a stroke. When I did come to um, the doc, Brian Corrigan, said, Ray, I'm advising you not to play again. You were very lucky to survive this, and that was it. So I didn't get to, the, get to play in the World Cup, but as I said, I uh, had the satisfaction of playing against Uruguay in Sydney and winning. Next come Australia, supported by Kangaroo and Koala Bear. 
but there is nothing in their pouch beyond their spirit. Would they have thought 32 years in 74 before they were to qualify again? I don't think anybody would have envisaged that. It was one of the longest and most painful sporting sagas in Australian history. I'd lost the support of the chairman and the board. Well, I felt sorry for Frank Farina. To a large extent, he was in a heavyweight fight with one hand tied behind his back. And the resources that have been made available to coaches since, for one reason or other, weren't made available to him. I think immediately FFA should uh, not be looking overseas. They have the right people here in Australia to do the job. I still believe we had candidates uh, that could have replaced Frank. At the end of the day, though, when the alternative is someone like Goose Hiddink, who you know, is one of the great coaches of world football. Goose Hiddink is a football icon. He's now been thrust into turning around the Socceroos' dismal history on the field, replacing Frank Farina as Australia's national coach. Well, it was a, it was a surprise because I was involved and engaged by PSV Eindhoven. I cannot do it another way than bringing all the players to, to Holland. And it was not a big deal because 95% of the selection was playing in Europe somewhere. So it was nice, it was practical. Mr. Frank Lowy and, and John Bowlby, John O'Neill, they came to Eindhoven. And there we agreed to do it as it, it was possible. No disrespect to the, to the organisation or set up or to anyone involved, but it wasn't up to the standard that it needed to be. And when Goose took over, it went from being here to hear in terms of the way we went about things, the way we did things. It was an experienced squad that just needed the, the guidance, I suppose, of someone who'd already been there. He'd come in and he'd been there and he, he actually was ruthless with us. And I remember one story also by, by Mark, Mark Vaduka. He, after the training, <clears throat> he, came, he came and sit next to me in, on, on the bench after training was, was ended. And he said, why are you taking, why are you taking the, the Aussie team? We didn't qualify for 32 years. He said, why are you, why are you taking? You're careful with your name. I said, I don't care so much about my name. I, I like to work. Well, why do you do that? I said, no, no, because I like to go to the World Cup. Uh, we too, but uh, there was this little bit negative attitude. And I said to him, if you go back now to England and you lose two, three, four kilos now, next time you come here, if you have lost those kilos on your, on your body, then we are making the first step. And then he came and I must say, I said, hey, Marky, now, now we are going. For now, though, it's about adjusting to new coach Gus Hiddink and building the side's confidence. Something different, someone different somebody with a little bit of authority on the international scene. We knew we had a lot of ability in the team and now we had a coach who was regarded as, as one of the best in the world. So we knew if we had any realistic chance of, of going to a World Cup that this was our time. The entire nation could breathe a sigh of relief as the full-time whistle sounded to secure Uruguay's playoff against Australia. No, look, I was happy. The other uh, teams that we were looking at was Colombia. And we didn't want to go there. I think the other one was Chile. I watched uh, Uruguay play Argentina, but I sat in the crowd, in amongst, you know, what we thought beforehand in 2001 was an extremely intimidating atmosphere, that it was just families that uh, were there supporting the game. So I didn't find sitting in the crowd intimidating at all. You know, the whole thing around Uruguay the second time was we'd been there and experienced it and, and we knew what we were in for. To get a result maybe that sets us up to qualify uh, is absolutely outstanding. The qualification is over two legs and uh, we have to do, do the job over there. With just a couple of hours sleep, the Socceroos were on the move for the long flight to Montevideo. And I remember looking at their body language uh, when we transited in New Zealand and, and they, were, they were super cool, super relaxed. And thinking back now, I understand why, because they knew exactly what was going to happen in, in, in Montevideo. 
got to say, I've played a lot of places in football. I've never seen anything like that. Once we arrived at the airport, they started going through each, uh, each bag that we had and taking forever for us to, to check through customs. I, I think that then gave us an idea of what to, uh, what to expect. And uh, it was just total, total chaos. There weren't that many people there. It was really about 50 people, but they were nicely sort of lined up to be able to spit on us and throw things at us. They won the game as we got off the bus in Montevideo. It felt like me, to me, that we were, we were, it was a scene from a movie, like, a, like the Gladiator movie. And we, we come out in the middle and you just looked around and there was 60,000 uh, Uruguayan supporters who just made this noise that you couldn't hear yourself talk. A third now, and it's all over for Australia. Morales. Now, Arnie Graham Arnold always used to say to me, if you, if you play your best, we've got a good chance of winning. And I don't think I played, I played well at all in, in, in Montevideo. So from my perspective, I felt like I let the team down. Um... The atmosphere in the change room uh, in Montevideo after the game. I don't think any of us spoke a word for probably half an hour or so. I remember sitting in the change room after and uh, yeah, nobody moved for, for who knows how long. Everything was, was, was silent. I, I think the thought was, you know, will we ever qualify? Sir Arthur, how's this win in Hong Kong going to affect the popularity of soccer in Australia? Well, I think it's achieved the first step which is necessary to the stabilisation of soccer as a major sport. It has obliterated the past story of glorification of, of officials and substituted for it what I wanted to substitute always, and that is the glorification of the players. That should have been the time to take it over, but uh, the powers that be didn't let it happen. I mean, uh, you know, the next minute Rasik's not doing the job and a few of the players have started to retire and, and, and many missed out on the next World Cup. 1977 World Cup campaign was shit. It seemed very difficult to be able to achieve. We, we, we probably should have done much better, yeah. It was like a disaster and, you know, we, we turned, we went from socceroos to flopperoos straight, you know, in, in a click of a finger. I didn't want to go through that pain again. <laughs> Too many knives in the heart. 1985 just wasn't meant to be. Frank Arick actively campaigned to have the return leg played in Darwin on a cow paddock. But he didn't give a rats about the quality of the game. He just wanted a result. It was at Olympic Park in Melbourne. It was a beautiful, cool, early summer's evening. It was perfect for Scotland. As the referee blows the final whistle, it's been a long, hard campaign. It was empty. It was a really empty feeling. For our, our guys, they're really carrying the, the game in this country on their very broad shoulders. I think we let it go. We lost it, you know, ourselves. And then we've always felt cheated and the referee and what happened and not enough time. And... He's bound for full time. By my reckoning, he's added on just 30 seconds of stoppage time. And that, to me, is impossible. That was sort of something that you'd never forget. You know, I remember that, the occasion. It was just so hard. So it was like the underdog missed out again, the underdog missed out again. And now the call beckons again. i tell you what, you go to the uh, DVDs and you get out the, the goals that he scored for Napoli and winning the World Cup on his own, we go, yeah, this is just a qualifier. And still Maradona, who comes a dangerous looking cross and the goal! They all, like within a goal, an own goal of getting knocked out of the World Cup by part-time footballers. Students scored two goals at this end, and now it's an own goal, it's a deflection! Tragedy for Australia! After an exhausting seven qualifying games, our hopes of reaching next year's World Cup finals in France now hinge on just one game and what a game it's shaping up to be. I think there was a belief um, that the, the team was, was going to qualify simply because of the way we've been playing. I think it was a, uh, a very experienced team. I guess my recollections from the game clearly was that it, it, it looked more like a game that was going to be 3-0 than 2-all. He cross! Uh, 
know, the line was broken and, and you know, they got, they got through. It was one of those, uh, yeah, defining moments, not easily forgotten. Ali Doi, danger for Australia here, the flag's down! It's an equaliser for Iran! I tell you the truth, if we had a winner here, it should have been Australia. A third now, and it's all over for Australia. Morales. Up until then, we, we still weren't taken serious, and this was our moment for the history of what was before us to finally yeah, have that feeling of uh, playing uh, in a World Cup. And, and that's something that'll, that lives with me, will live with me forever. Of course, I was uh, very interested in the past because um, I was wondering why they did not, why they did not qualify in the past. And one thing I learned that, that yeah, the team and everything around the team was very obstructed and molested uh, in everything, in the organization, in travel, in, in not uh, going into the training field. It was like all those little details, but accumulated. It's, it's a big frustration. In 2005, we were able to go to Buenos Aires and train for a week and settle and get in the time zone. And no one was around. The Argentines actually helped us because they didn't want. To, they wanted us to beat Uruguay. And I called also FIFA. I said I read also the previous time it was not very good guided by FIFA, from the airport to the hotel, etc., etc. And I, I, if not, we we going to have a, a quarrel. And and surprisingly, everything was okay. You know, the bus came to the uh, to the plane to pick us up. We didn't go through customs. We knew what we were about to get into, but I think we were already ahead of the game. You see in the footage, <laughs> looking back, that uh, the other fans were quite vocal, um, rude at times, and uh, you know, we were sitting in the bus going to the hotel thinking, oh, this is quite brilliant. Yeah, it was a bit of fun. Uh, you knew what to expect. You just had a good laugh, and um, we knew we weren't intimidated. The second time we found it funny because we were more mature as a group. I think for us, we didn't really mind anyway because we were quite easy going lads and we just basically went with the flow and we just thought that's what it was like. Football Federation Australia has declined Uruguay's request to move the Montevideo qualifier forward from 9pm by four hours. Uruguay even had the referees changed because Belgians might be biased towards Australia's Dutch coach. I experienced a lot of international games. The referees in, in modern time has improved a lot, so uh, I don't have any any uh, inconvenience or whatsoever. So it, it, it will be, I think, uh, a well-judged game. Gus had experienced, you know, the coaching around the world, and uh, so he brought a relaxed feeling to the, the side. We'd been away in camp for about a week, and. Uh, uh, back in Spain, we're used to having wine with your dinner, you know, it's only a glass of wine and the, the players all did it and uh, it'd been a week since I had a glass with my dinner and I, I you know, asked Gus if I could uh, have a glass of wine. Towards the end of training, he lined us up on the, uh, on the halfway line and we had to, uh, you know, crossbar challenge, see who could uh, hit the crossbar and he said that he'll, you know, put a bottle of red if someone, uh, someone got it. We didn't get close. And he goes, I'll tell you what, if I can hit the crossbar from the halfway line, you buy me a bottle. If I miss, then uh, I'll buy you a bottle. I said, no problem. And he had the ball in his hands. I thought he's got no chance of getting this. He volleyed it out of his hands. Hitting with the, uh, you know, he had that uh, charisma and yeah, it wasn't arrogance. Just picked the ball up and, and volleyed it. Bounced once and hit the crossbar. And we're like, you're kidding us, huh? Just bounced, probably just past the penalty spot and hit the crossbar, so I had to buy him a bottle of wine. And then uh, at the meal time, he came around and started giving uh, probably more the senior players a, a glass of red or who, whoever wanted a glass of red. But I was happy anyway, because I ended up having a glass. <laughs> the boys were up getting pre-match meal and hitting walks up and he goes, did someone shit? It smells like someone's done a shit, He's shitting their pants. Come on, it's only football, it's fun. I think just going in the coach on the way to the game and the abuse that we got and, and the, the feeling of like, I, I remember just tapping a few of the lads and going, look at this. Well, this is a whole different flavour of what we're used to.
you know, just before the games, probably about an, uh, an hour 15 before the game. That's where players get, you know, very nervous. I had one experience with, with Gus that, you know, getting strapped before that game, he sat, well, he sat on a chair close to me and he pulled out a little DVD player and he was watching uh, Van Basten's goal. And he was talking to me about how good this goal was. And Gus is there with his headphones on, uh, watching a DVD player and uh, watching some game from Spain. And he would go to a player, look at this, yeah, he's not bad. And, and it just dawned on me that how calm and relaxed he was because he felt we were ready. So there was no ranting and raving in the change room before the game, where maybe four years earlier you're trying to pump yourself up and you know, you're young, you know, you, you know, it's a big crowd and you, you're up for it. Maybe a little bit too emotional. You know, you can remember the concrete and the change rooms you, and I could actually feel the stadium moving. I don't know whether the other boys could. If I close my eyes, I can feel it. It was just like a boom and they were jumping outside and there's just like vibration just constantly happening. Neither Brazil nor Argentina have ever won here in a competitive game. That's the size of the task facing Australia tonight. It was a difficult game for me. Um, it was a foul against me and they scored from the free kick, so I was a little bit disappointed from that. But from my perspective, it wasn't a foul. <laughs> I think, I think the, the player milked it a bit, so, but, but I copped the criticism for it. It comes now from uh, Perez. Perez lets the ball go out in front. He bumps into... Oh, that should be a free kick. Is it play on? Uh, it's a free kick the other way! That's unbelievable! It was a cross into the far post and, and the boy got, got in there. From this free kick. The Corpus delivery. Oh, Manfred at the far post goal. It's Dario Rodriguez. We obviously got over that very quickly because, you know, we, we did very well for the rest of the game. For me, I knew we were going to qualify when Schwartz had come out in the first game and did it. It got blown no foul. It was about 65 minutes of the game, we were down 1 0. 2 0, that's nearly tie over. The referee didn't give the foul or the penalty. And I thought to myself, wow, this is it. At the end, we lost 1 0, which is an okay result, but a difficult result. This time, it was a different feel. I'm telling you, it was, it was such a different feel. We thought in our minds and what we saw was this was not a bad result. Maybe we were a little bit naive. Seeing the result, they were able to, to get away from home, you know, that flight back home, that's when I started feeling the confidence, started feeling that, you know, this could be the time. There was a police escort to ensure a smooth ride out of town and nothing was too much for the Socceroos during their 18-hour dream flight from Montevideo. There's one thing that I think any sports person hates and footballers in general playing for the Socceroos was travelling. I mean, when you're sitting in a chair crammed in like sardines for, for 10, 15, 20 hours at times, it becomes very uh, difficult um, and challenging on the body. Doctors, physios and massage experts were on hand to help iron out any sore spots. You know, some people talk about business class. Well, I don't know what class this was. We had the whole plane to ourselves, so <laughs> it was amazing. So for Goose to enable us to have that, and I know for a fact that he had to fight very hard for us to have that, uh, was a big step up on Uruguay, as they, as rumours say, that they had it quite difficult. Uruguay touched down more than two hours earlier, but they were forced to fly economy. We had a private, uh, we had a chartered flight. So what we did is we pre-booked all the business class flights on Chilean Air, but we weren't going on it. <laughs> so, the, so the Uruguayans couldn't get them. <laughs> I think, I, I think that, that was the difference about having someone like Gus Hiddink in charge. Uh, only a man of his calibre could, uh, could get away with doing something like that and saying to him, if you want to qualify for a World Cup, these are the, these are the extras. We think it's going to be a, different, a totally different game over, over here and uh, hopefully there'll be 85,000 people out there, you know, egging us on, mate.
they think that we're going to roll over and give it to them on a plate, well, they've got another thing coming. When you, when you heard that, you're like, uh, nah, we'll just shove it in your face. I, rem I remember distinctly the hullabaloo that emanated from Rakova's comments. Yeah, I think that's, you know, when you say something like that, you sarp yourself and it just geared us up to, to, you know, to make sure that they weren't there. Arrogance and lack of respect. It's a nice phrase, you, haven't put it, you have to put it on the wall, it's nice. To suggest that they had the right to go to the World Cup based on what? Yeah, they'd won a World Cup in the past, but that was a very long time ago. We're talking about the present, and, and we felt that we were just as good as what they were, so we had as much right to make it to the World Cup as they did. Pero, pero bueno, yo estaba convencido que nosotros lo íbamos a ganar. Convencido. Convencido porque, ya te digo, eh, yo creo que todavía, más allá de, de, de que habíamos mejorado mucho futbolísticamente, eh, seguían siendo ingenuos en algo. I thought it was more a, 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 a very accurate statement reflecting what Urugu Uruguayans grow up to believe, and that is the place of football in their life um, is immovable. It was, yeah, it was different, you know, and I can remember just the booing and, and I reckon they would have probably been shocked at it. That was probably one of the things I remember the most, that feeling, and it was unexpected. That's when it sunk into me, you know, you know, we've got this, you know, the, we've got the fans behind us, we've got everyone behind us, we've got every chance possible to, to succeed. Do you know what? I, I don't like to see anything like that happen. That, for me, is a little bit disrespectful. Um, you know, that's the song of your country. But in saying that... <laughs> and I thought, oh, this is great. I can't explain how much energy that can give to somebody. It's even sometimes hard to control, but the, the, the atmosphere in the stadium was, for me, ugh, can't be repeated. Just remarkable scenes and remarkable noise. I do remember sitting in the commentary booth beforehand and thinking, wow, this is big, and you've got to get this right. Arno Rakova said this week that Uruguay had a divine right to be at the World Cup Finals. Well, we're going to have to earn it this evening. Standing over that ball, uh, it, was a, it, it, was, it was on. It was the biggest moment for all of us, but not just us, everyone that was in Australia. You to find out, cross your fingers, your toes, and your worry beats the hand. This is going to be a heck of a ride. Well, Husserink has gone for a team that has goals in mind this evening. Craig Foster, is that the team that uh, you would have picked if you were Husserink? I think so. The only surprise was maybe Harry Kuehl, whether that was a tactical switch or depended on his physical condition. Hus was great at um, uh, delegating. He'd say, so give me the team. I actually put Popper out and brought Timmy in. After about 10 minutes looking, he said, no, nah, we start cool on the bench. I went, my God, are you serious? He goes, Arnie, these type of games you only lose in the first half. 
you know, if we don't qualify, <laughs> you're going to get killed. <laughs> I'm moving back to Ireland with you. Maybe the, we can give a, a punch with Harry, relatively fresh coming in later in the game. That was the, the, the basic idea from that decision. So this was the day before the game, because we uh, only had one training session when we got back. And he said, give out the bibs to the starting lineup. And I'm thinking, oh, no, that means I don't give one to Harry. And, uh, and he said, and don't tell him, don't say a word to him. And Harry put his hand out for it, and I didn't give it to him. I kept walking past, you see Harry's face, and I thought, oh. And because Goose said, don't say anything to him. And he said, and he's going to take us to the World Cup. Trust me. Por decirlo de alguna manera, era el jugador sudamericano que tenían ellos, ¿no? un jugador con mucha clase, con mucho talento, eh, y, que, y que era el que nos podía complicar, y así fue. Recover, I think, at the time, uh, a massive threat to us and, and probably one of the best players in the world. We knew how dangerous Recover was. We knew how dangerous a lot of their players were. We knew that they probably wanted to hit us early. Recover always nicked the ball away from Fitbikes. Recover! Could have scored and possibly should have scored. I think I've gone to header it and he's got in front of me, taken a touch, and yeah, you put your house on it. Well, you would have put your house on Avara Recover there. He's asked to hit the target. Nelson hits the target. Esa fue una de las ocasiones que te digo, si nosotros hubiésemos hecho, si nosotros hubiésemos hecho el gol en esa jugada hubiese cambiado todo. Pero bueno, ahí en ese momento uno decide me fue un poco, se me quedó corta, la, o sea, se me fue, no corta ni, se me fue a un costado del palo. Eh, Seguramente si hubiésemos hecho ese gol hubiese cambiado todo. If imagine if he scores, yeah, then then it's it's almost over. That moment there, you think, well, maybe it's meant to be. Ooh, and that was uh, an arm across the face by Tony Popovich. Popovich is going to get a yellow card for that. Que bueno, capaz que sí era en ese momento mirándolo bien era justo que lo hubiesen expulsado, ¿no? Hitting was that was his experience. Straight away he said, "Aunt Harry, straight away on." Now, on. And Harry didn't have his bootlaces tied up or his shin pads in, so he was still getting ready. I was, I was having to fear a bit of a red card in, in, in for Popo. Rakoba getting the ball, running straight at Popovich, doing a step over, foul, bang, second yellow, World Cup over. Campaign over. But it was like, get him off now, get him off. And then I was thinking, hey, it's, it's early in the game, shall I bring Harry now or shall I bring another? Defender. I said, no, let's make this, the step now. Let's make the step now. Ahí fue muy inteligente el entrenador sabiendo de que, de que lo iban a echar en cualquier momento. Even to today, Pop he was pissed off. Like, what are they taking off for? Yeah, at, at the time when it happens, when you come off as a player, you, you're disappointed because you want to stay out there. But, you know, when you sit down and you, you cool down, you realize it's, it's all for, for, the, for the one goal, is to get through it. You know, H came on and things started happening and you could just see a, a lift in the side because Harry just started going at them and they, and they, they were fearful of Harry. Y era, el, creo que era la, 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 la gran figura que tenían ellos, me parece. Eh, creo que, que en ese partido lo, lo cambió él. Harry came on and was, was fantastic that night. It was hitting set there with a smile on his face. It was like he's, he's gone out there to show me. Still with Australia, it was out of play. Now to Tim Kyle, beautiful control on the chest, knocks it down to Kuehl. His first touch, super field. Finding Cahill. Kyle with space, and on the edge of the box, he's a take. Oh, Kuehl, it's still there. It's and it's, it's in. Still there. Australia have scored. Yes! yes! Marco Bresciano. I remember the ball getting played through to, to Harry, who made a nice little diagonal run. Went to shoot across his body, completely scuffed it. <laughs> you know, Harry's uh, an honest guy, and uh, he, he also says that he clearly miskicked it, but it was a good miskick. And, wow, well, you know, I'll never forget that celebration. I remember his celebration, clearly. It's obvious that that passion that has the football Uruguayo 
por el fútbol no lo tiene el australiano. Lo que sí en ese momento en el gol fue algo, eh, fue algo impresionante el, el, el estruendo, ¿no? el ruido que hace la gente. Arrived at the ground with my wife, who was seven and a half, eight months pregnant with our first child, so I even had her coming to a first big match and sat right here. And as the match played out, the anthems came out, everyone was cheering and, and you know, basically having the time of their life, except this one guy who was, you know, tense and, and sort of didn't show too much emotion. So the longer the night went on, the more and more I thought he was a Uruguayan fan. Telstra Stadium erupts. Australia are level. And the, the ground just went nuts, you know. I've, I've never seen anything like it. It was just the best atmosphere, the best moment of, you know, probably our footballing history. And I remember jumping up and down and giving high fives to everyone around you except this bloke who was still sort of motionless and sitting next to me and, do I give it to this guy? Do I say, what, what's going on? Why aren't you happy or whatever? And he, and he just grabbed me on the thigh and he said, that's my son. As a kid, I think every kid wants to just make their parents proud. Um, but it just showed, you know, what what it meant not only to the fans of football, but you know, obviously to my family. I know his dad very well. Um, I can imagine inside how happy he would be and how proud he was of his son. And this person actually thought he was a Uruguayan supporter and asked him, you know, why aren't you cheering, you know, what's, what's wrong? And obviously he replied, yeah, that's, that's my boy. Our players were obviously Herculean that evening, but there was some quite bizarre missing from some very storied players and he just got that feeling. And goes in and looking for Morales, free header, oh he's butchered it! Oh, he butchered the header! They don't miss these, you know. Morales doesn't miss these. Rakova doesn't miss these. They missed him. There was one time during the game, the, the, the camera went on this on the big screen, and I was chewing gum, like... And he leaned over and says, spit your gum out, you look like Mr Ed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was sitting on a bench with his chewing gum and sitting like, like this, I think, like this. And then, of course, sometimes because you're getting on the, on the camera, and then your my face, his face was on on the screen. I said, "Honey, what you what you doing, man? You're you, you're sitting there like I'm nervous. I'm nervous. Come on, spit out this chewing gum, Mr. Ed." Rakova has left the field for Marcelo Zelayeta. Well, that is an amazing decision. I was well. I was with And Rakova hasn't even gone to the bench. Lo que pasa es que hoy es obvio, es fácil decir, bueno, pero tenías que haberte quedado o esto. Pero bueno, en ese momento creo que, que Jorge, que Fossati, creyó que era lo mejor para el equipo. Y bueno, eh, con mucha lástima, porque ya te digo, nos estábamos jugando una clasificación y uno quería ser partícipe, pero es obvio que el compañero que iba a entrar eh, iba a ser lo mejor porque, porque nos salían bien las cosas. Cuando salió Paolo fue producto por, de, de lo que hablamos, ¿no? De la mala, de la hermana, de la mala organización que tuvimos para poder llegar al, a ese partido revancha, ¿no? Del vuelo, de, de las comodidades, de, de, de todo lo que hablamos antes. Well, that's a huge blow for Uruguay. El grande capitán Paolo Montero is cutting a very forlorn figure. I can still remember that I actually wasn't tired. Well, there it is. Final whistle. Australia have won on the night by goal to nil, but it's full square and aggregate. So we're going to be in extra time. Why do we have to do things so so hard? We're fatalistic. Yeah, okay, this is great, but we know what's going to happen next. And you know, as the game wore on, the tension grew and everyone's like, here we go again. You knew it was something was going to happen. Something special was about to happen that uh, that night. Probably one of the biggest moments for me as a player, regardless whether we got on or not was the presence, of course. The arrogance that we had with him standing there. There's a presence that comes with him that does put a bit of fear into the opposition. And people say, well, he's just standing. It's not. Simon, very interesting. I can see a few Aussies warming up, including 
Zelko Kalas. And I just wonder whether or not Hiddick is toying with the idea of bringing them on should this go to a penalty shootout. What was it? Maybe 10 minutes or so before the end of extra time, I remember seeing out of the corner of my eye um, Zelko warming up on the sideline with Tony Franken and thinking, that, that's just odd. What's going on? And trying to work out how have we done all the, how did we made all the substitutions yet and realizing we hadn't and I just thought is he is he doing what, is he gonna do what I think he's gonna do? And then just trying to stay focused on the game but still also corner my eye always been distracted by it. If Edmonton didn't come off with the cramps, I think 99% it was gonna happen. It's not a decision you make in one split second. You grow, you can grow to a decision, and then you feel if you do it, yes or no. I was ready to come on. There was no no problem with that. Uh, Emo, our fittest player ever that I've played with, comes off with cramps. So I've got to thank you for that, Emo. Emo coming off with cramp? What the hell? That doesn't happen. You know, he's he's um he's like a robot. And a change for Australia. Wilco Fred Emerton's made way for Joe Skoko. Muyosup Skoko onto the field now. Maybe I owe him a bit of an apology, or maybe Swartz owes me something for, <laughs> for letting him uh, stay on the pitch and, and become the hero. Thankfully it didn't happen, and thankfully I can, I can uh, think about what did happen and, 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 uh, and, you know, have played my part. There it is. Penalty kicks will decide a place World Cup 2006. Australia's destiny be for 11 metres. Yeah, I remember Arnie coming over and said, nah, look, I'm shattered, mate. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to take one? I said, nah, I'm, I'm finished. I don't want to take one. He sort of pencilled me in for number six, and, and um, you know, that was in the back of my mind during the whole shootout. For me, it was almost gut wrenching knowing that. I was probably next in line after John Aloisi to have to take a penalty. I preferred to go further down the line. If I had to, I would have. But the players that lined up for the penalties, um, you know, that's that's our penalty takers. Y era de los que pateaba, sí. Es insignificante para lo que para lo que pasó, que ya pasó. Y digo, si estuviera ahí, seguramente hubiese pateado como he pateado mi vida toda mi vida los penales. Harry Q is the man with the responsibility of the first one for Australia. 90 minutes of extra time, was drama. We ain't seen nothing yet, folks. Here we go. It's Harry Kuehl against Fabian Carini. First penalty, Australia. Yeah. Goal. Beautifully put away by Harry Kuehl. Somebody was bothering me, and they were asking me like I was uh, some magician, um, what would the penalty shootout result be? And I, and, I, and I tried to fob them off because I was intent on watching the game, but on his insistence, I gave him an answer. And my answer was, we would win and Mark Schwartz would save two penalties. And the only reason I said it in that way was that I was reflecting back to the Canada penalty shootout uh, back in, in 93 before the, uh, uh, the Argentina series. It's all down to that man, Mark Schwartz, and five of his teammates. Bunbury and Schwartz and Might try to glide it around. Well, I, all I was thinking was that um, in this situation is that, you know, it's a hugely pressured situation. It's a World Cup qualifier. It's, it is to get to the World Cup. <clears throat> it's not to get through the next round like it was against Canada. I thought we're playing a South American opponent. All these things are going through my mind thinking, well, they're going to be waiting for me to make the first move. And I thought, well, let's, let's sort of just, let me try and stay on my feet and let's try and push a little bit more pressure on them by making them make the first move. And when I didn't make the first move, then all of a sudden they were left with a dilemma, you know, to try and put the ball past me. And uh, in this instance, it worked well. He stutters, he goes again, he moves in. Schwarzer saves it! Schwarzer saves! Unbelievable! Mark Schwarzer! Still need nerves of steel from the spot. Next up is Lucas Neal, who's had a great game. Although we think, eh, this is a central defender, he cannot make a penalty. Most of the time, they don't, they don't fail so much. Carini, Lucas Neal moves in. Yes! Side netting, would you believe? And a punch of the air! It's tense. 
good guys sweet sweet. on halfway, arm in arm. The team spirit for the jersey. Now here's Gustavo Varela. Another save from Schwartz or Australia, and nearly there. It's Varela. Schwartz have picked the right direction, but they're on the board, Uruguay, and on the board is very important at this stage. Who said to me, he goes, Honey, he said, sort out the, the penalty takers. We practiced them the night before, but uh, Bresciano had taken one, but Bresci was off the pitch. I didn't have a number three penalty taker. I went around to Skokes, who just came on. I said to Skokes, you take a penalty. He said, No, mate, I just come on, I haven't touched a ball. Brett Emerton had to come off with a cramp. Jason Chalina said, no, no chance. He ran the other direction. I went to Tony Vidmar. All over for Australia, Morales. That's it. It's all over. Four years, hard work. It was probably a few minutes before the end of the game that uh, I reckon the emotion started to, uh, to come out, to pour out. Probably looking around and saying, well, this has probably been the last time that I'll play for Australia. And I um, you know, spoke to Arnie and said, yeah, that's it. And I'm going to you know, end it now. And, and he said, no, nah, don't be stupid. Uh, you know, you still got another four years. Just to sit on it and, and you know, when it comes closer to, to the next lot of games, then we can discuss it then. I'd never seen him take a penalty in his life. And I said to him, Spike, you want to take a penalty? He said, mate, redemption. It's my time. From Tony Vidmar, his fourth World Cup campaign, a man who left the last stage last year, the last chapter, sodden in tears, places the ball. Just pick your spot. Come on, Tony. It's Vidmar. Beautiful. It's beautifully put Good away. Good on you, son. 3-1, Australia in the shootout. Outstanding. Well, my brother was in the stand earlier. I was in the stand with some friends. When he saw me walk, walking up, he goes, what the f*** is he doing taking the penalty? And then I think it was someone else who goes, what the f*** is he taking it with his left for? <laughs> I think maybe there was 90,000 people who were themselves when I was taking time to take it up. Now, a lot of responsibility. Very young man's shoulders. Fabian Estoyanov. It's 3-1 at the moment to Australia. This will make it 3-2. Estoyanov moves in, yes. Side netting right side. Beautifully tucked away by Estoyanov. Yeah. 3-2. Must get this one. You must get this one. Yeah, I remember after training, Goose made it, each and every player step up and, and take a penalty. To be honest, I think I missed mine. It, it's certainly a different a different pressure to walking up with just the Australian coaching staff watching from the sideline. <laughs> he did exactly the same penalty the day before. Exactly the same. Same run up. Missed it just by the same amount. Exactly the same. William Arnold can't look. Paducah. Oh, he's put it wide. Would you believe it? Probably of all people, I would probably have put my house on, on Duke scoring. He was probably the only player that I thought, you know, there's no chance of him missing. He's been a great captain. Now up to Mark Schwarzer. This would be a great one to save. Schwarzer was, um, I, I don't know if there's many words you can put to it. Well, I was lucky because Zalayeta played with me at Perugia. Basically, I said to him, Zalayeta shoots every single time to your left. Every time. He opens up and hits it to his left. Every time. Every time I've seen him, he hit it to his left. Now, had I been in goals, maybe he wouldn't have hit it to his left. Maybe he would have hit it to the right. But, you know, when someone puts a ball there, 10 out of 10 times, you're pretty sure that he's going to go there again. And here is Jalasheta now with Schwarzer. And she's yes, that! He's that! He's that! It's as big as we've ever seen in Australia. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, it is. When anyone ever asks me what's the best save we've ever made, and I've always said that I don't actually ever class him as best saves or what was my best save, or I leave it up to other people to, to, to really diagnose whether that's the best save or not. I look at the most significant saves, the most important saves that I've made in my, in my career, and 
Apart from probably the, uh, the Canada saves, it would have to be the, the two saves against Uruguay and, and equally one is not more important or less important than the other, so they were both very, very sitting there. There are always goalies who uh, stop more penalties than other goals, but other goalies. And, uh, but he did in this game, chapeau. As soon as Swartz saved his, I just felt a sense of relief because I knew that that was it. We we're going to go to the World Cup. I think I was warming up for about a half a game. Kept on looking at Gus, you know, I'm ready, I'm ready, put me on. Put me on because I, I know I can feel something's going to happen. I had that feeling for, for four years. There's a great photo of uh, the, the players jumping in the air and, and I just started walking those first couple of steps and the focus was there and you know I can remember there was you know still cheering going on and 83,000 people but it didn't feel like there was anyone in the stadium. It felt like there was a few people in the stadium whispering you know is this it? Are we going to go to the World Cup? If he scores are we going? That means that if John Aloisi can score this goal... John Aloisi! Sí, el último penal no, no. No, Morales no me comentó nada de, de Aloisi, ni Morales ni García, que también estaban, estaban con él en el, en el Osasuna, me, me dijeron nada. Australia will be there. Are you sure? To catapult Australia into the World Cup. This for the dream realized. Here's Aloisi for a place in the World Cup. He moves in. before, where's, where's our family sitting? You know, I'd ask the team manager, and he said, oh, they're, they're going to sit over there. I said, oh, OK. And he goes, why? And I said, oh, I just want to know where I'm going to run to when I score the winning goal. I knew where I was running to. The top coming off was definitely not planned, but uh, it was just uh, one of those moments that just felt like the right thing to do because it was such a, an amazing feeling. I don't know if it was because he wasn't Australian. He, know, he knew what it meant to us, but I think he grasped how big it was in the days after. We thought it was going to happen. We've been dreaming of it for 32 years, and we couldn't ask for a better, better finish. We've 83,000 people here to watch us, 20 million people in Australia following us. We just can't believe it. And Ange Postacog, we asked all the Socceroos, the current Socceroos, what does it mean to play for Australia? Jason got up and he said, I didn't realise how important it was to be an Australian, to play for Australia, until that uh, Uruguay game. And he said, they just won the game, we're all happy. And I turned to my father and he was crying. And I guess for me, all that pain of not qualifying was the difference, you know. And um, meeting all the players after the game, and obviously, you know, introducing Jason to Dukes and all the all the boys and all that. I just said to Jason, I said, keep the photos with them, you know. I said, one day they'll be your teammates. At that moment. At the moment when it all went right, I did think back to a lot of the people that I was close with over the years. Thinking about John Cosmina, for example, who's, who's a great mate of mine, just thinking, I wish Cosie had been able to, to be part of something like this. There are a lot of people over a lot of years who deserve to have a moment like that in their careers and didn't get it. 
you know, I think back at some of the moments that I had in all those, you know, 30 odd years of being in Montevideo and just almost having a breakdown at full time, just going to myself, is it ever going to change? You, then you look forward and you go, wow, finally, finally it's happening. This is going to be the game changer. And it's been you know, amazing right ever since. The thing that stuck in my mind the most, and it was probably just as good as the um, penalty shootout, it was uh, meeting John Travolta. <laughs> it was, you know, I was a massive Greece fan, you know, growing up. Saturday Night Fever, I knew all the words to Greece. And so when he's walked in, you know, there's Danny Zuko. <laughs> But we would get to a certain part and we'd stop singing because we didn't know all the words. <laughs> <laughs>